Uh, so thanks for the invite again. Like I think it's a really cool cool event, even though it's very far from my office. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'll be talking more about the practical applications of quantum theory and. I was told that this should be a more technical talk, so I hope you guys are fine with the math. Uh, let's try. Okay, so the outline of this talk is really, you know, about the how of quantum, and yeah, that's what the math will be, and the so what of quantum. Um, quantum can be one. Yeah. So that's the. Uh, it's basically why. Our center is the Center for Quantum Technology, and a lot of the researchers in our um, center are working on these things. So, just now, Clive mentioned that there are two aspects to quantum mechanics that is quite fundamental to it, right? It's uncertainty and entanglement. And what I really want to do in this in my talk is to show you exact applications of these two principles and how we can use them. So, it, for uncertainty. Actually, uncertainty is not that weird as, um, you know, for example, if, um, in classical mechanics and in everyday life, you always have uncertainty. But what's really weird in quantum uncertainty is that it is discrete objects that can be in superposition and interfere with each other. So this is a slightly more biblically accurate version of the beam slitter experiment that we saw at the time, um, where you have an uh, input and it kind of a uh, photon that kind of goes out to two outputs on either side. And the thing is that when you have a single photon, you're always only detected at one of the two paths. Right? If you put it to the path, sometimes you detect it at the upper path, sometimes you detect it in the lower path. And so again, the weirdness of the uncertainty of the interference comes in the fact that it interferes for discrete objects, mutually exclusive outcomes. And this discreteness comes about because we only ever find a photon either here or there. Right? And instead of saying here or there, we can say, well, if it's in the lower path, we call it zero. If it's in the upper path, we call it one. And so doing this, we say that we prepare a state in a uh, system in a state that is zero. And we let it uh, pass through the system. We do something to this to this photon, and it becomes something else. It, it changes the state from zero to a state that looks like a uh, one over root two, one plus zero. Uh, or you can start with the photon the upper state, uh, upper part, and then that would be saying that you prepare the state photon in the state one. You do something to the photon with the beam system and you get some other state. This time you get a 1 over root 2 minus uh, 1 minus 1 over root 2, 0. So, but the weird thing is that, again, you only ever find the photon in one of the two paths. When you look at the photon, you either find it above or below. And this is where, uh, so, okay, if you're not familiar with the notation, this is the probability of, given that your input is 1, what is the output? And this probability, uh, as we saw from the, okay, so this is where the math comes in, okay? So I told you that the beam shifter is like taking the input one and doing something to it. And then it comes out in this weird, uh, let me switch the list over. No. Okay, so it comes out in this weird state, right? And what we really want to know is that. In this weird state, how likely will we find it in the upper path? How likely will we find it in the lower path? And so the probability that if you put it in the one state, how likely will you find it in the one state in the output? Is given by this thing called the Bond rule. So the Bond rule is the saying that you have this weird expression. Just look at the weird expression. Look for the state that you want to find, in this case, one and you just square the number in front. And this is what, and that's all you need to do, right? Here, it's one over root two. You take the one over root two, you square it, and it tells you that the probability that you find it in the upper part is half, which was what Clive told you just now, except now we're doing the actual math, okay? And what about the other? The probability of finding it in the lower half, zero, 
given that it came in from the upper bound. Why? Well, you again, this time you have a minus sign, but that's fine. You just square it, and you again, you get half. So this is the mathematical way of saying that if you put one photon to a visitor, there is a 50% chance of finding it in the upper part and 50% chance of finding it in the lower part. So, I mean, I, I mentioned this now to, to some people that I think quantum mechanics math is easier than classical mechanics math, and this is why. Okay, so, um, but these inverse doesn't always be hard, okay? So if you look at this cat, um, it is reflected slightly, but it is mostly transmitted out of the window. Right? So you will expect that if you put a single photon through this window, most of it will be passed through, but some of it will be reflected. And so in general, you can describe these situations by having uh, assigning different probabilities, you, uh, sorry, diff different weights to them. So instead of uh, one over two on both sides, you have something like cosine and sine theta. And nothing much has changed. You just take the ball rule, you look at the number, if you have to find the probability of getting one, given one, you just look at the number in front, and you square it, and that's what you get. And it's the same thing for the one below. Okay, so that's the math. Um, and this is where the computing part comes in. You have a mutually exclusive uh, two mutually exclusive situations, upper and lower paths, you call it 0 and 1. This is like having quantum bits um, with the bond rule telling you what the output will be. Okay? So, and quantum bits, so we don't like to say that a lot, so we call it qubits. Okay. Um, so, so what we have is that we have a V-sitter, which is a physical thing. We have a way of saying, I, if I prepare the photon in one state, which is a zero state, I can kind of do operations on this, on the system. And in this case, the V-sitter acting on the photon being in the state zero is, uh, gives you this state that is one over root two of zero and one. And if I put photon in the upper path, this is saying the beta that acting on the state 1 is 1 over root 2, 1 minus 1 over root 2, 0. Uh, and I call these states the plus state and the minus state. Now, the, the thing that I showed you just now with the, with the two interfering patterns kind of looks like this, right? Where if you start from the lower path, you always find it in the upper path and vice versa. And so it's basically applying the beta state operation twice on your system. And what the, what the observation tells you, you can describe in math by saying that if you apply the beam setter twice on the zero state, you get the one state. And if you apply the beam setter twice on the one state, you get something like minus the zero state, but this doesn't really matter because you're gonna square it anyway. Okay, so this is the math of applying operations to a quantum state. And the action of the beam sitter, if you stare at this for a while, reminds you of something that I don't know if you are, probably you guys know more than me about classical logic states, right? So if you do nothing, you do nothing, you put in a zero bit, these are classical bits now, you put in a zero bit, you get a zero bit, you put in a one bit, you get a one bit. Uh, so x gives you x. If you have the not bit, you put in the zero bit, you get the one bit, right? So I'm describing it as you take the zero bit, you, you, you have some arrow at point I mean, It's a nice picture. Now if you put a one bit, you get a zero bit. This is like very simple, right? So you, you put in x, you just x plus one uh, um, binary addition. If you have two not gates, I hope this is not too boring, but you, get, you put in a zero bit, you get a zero bit. You put in a one bit, you get a one bit. And it's kind of like you're doing a, a loop in this uh, for the two bits, right? So you put in x, you get x. So if you look back at the beam center, well, they're direct quantum analogs. If you do nothing to your system, if you put in zero, you get zero. You put in one, you get one. 
if you apply the least data points, you start from the lower part, you end up in the upper part. And that is like an octave, right? You start with the zero state, you end up with the one state. And vice versa. This is exactly the not gate. And if you apply it, so because we apply the mean set points, let me just call it B squared. And if you apply B squared points, you end up at the same place. Right? So if, uh, doing B squared points is like doing nothing to the system. Okay. Here's a weird part. B squared is a not gate. But what is B then? Right? It's something that is, you know, you have you stop halfway while doing the not gate. And if we want to take this geometric like illustration very seriously, we would say, okay, like taking the the beam sitter gate, the B gate, is kind of like you're not going fully from the zero to one, but you're stopping halfway. So I'm gonna draw it there, draw the plus state there, which is what you end up with is you put the zero state uh, into the beam sitter. And by the way, if you put the one state in the beam center, you get something like the minus state. And so um, that's what you get. Okay. So, but that was a very specific beam center, right? If you have a more general beam center, right, you, if you act on the zero state, you get some kind of cosine in sides. Right? It might not be exactly one over root two on both sides. Uh, so I'm going to call this. Uh, state theta. And so in general, if we again take the geometric picture very seriously, uh, applying a quantum gate to the zero state is like kind of rotating it along this zero, one, plus and minus uh, radius. Right? Uh, and the same thing for if you apply the one state, you kind of go the other way. Right? So if all else fails, if you don't listen to me the rest of the talk, just kind of look at this picture and think about it that way. Okay. So, Bond's rule is math. Uh, this is also math. But I think this gives a more intuitive understanding, not say understanding, but intuitive idea of how the probabilities will act out. So if you look at the Bond's rule, Problem, if you start at zero, you apply the theta gate. Now you are at state theta. The probability that you'll find it in the state zero when you measure it is given by, you, again, you look at the expression there, look at what's in front of the zero, and you just square it. So geometrically, if you look at this picture, it's really kind of saying that the closer you are in this geometric picture to the zero's state, the more likely you will observe zero when you measure it. And so, and vice versa, if you look at, um, of course, you only get zero or one, so these two must add up to one, 100% probability. So, the reason why I use this geometric picture um, is because if we interpret it that way, these gates act exactly like we expect them to when we apply them one after another. Right? So if we had a theta gate first, it will perform some kind of um, operation from zero to theta, and then you apply the phi gate, it will take the theta state and move it by another angle phi. And so they compose exactly like you expect, and the same thing for the one state. If you started there, you apply the theta, um, you go from one to, to uh, theta plus pi, and uh, another pi uh, for the second gate. So, so this is the geometric picture to, to keep track of. And what you realize is that unlike uh, classical uh, logic, where there are exactly two logical gates acting on one bit, which is the knot and the identity, you have a continuum of single qubit logic gates, which are all you can go all the way from the identity all the way to the not gate and everything in between. And this is kind of uh, the building block for quantum computing. Right? Every um, is the expansion of this bit from the zero and ones into this continuum of states. So 
from this, we can kind of expect that there are also two, two qubit gates, which are a bit more complicated, but their actions are quite uh, easy to explain. So we have something called controlled logic gates. So if you look at the left-hand side, um, okay, if you look at the left-hand side, okay, these two lines are describing two qubits. And the, if the top qubit is state zero, then nothing happens to the bottom qubit. But if you look at the right-hand side, if the top qubit is state one, then what it does is it, it flips the second qubit. Okay. And uh, so generally, uh, whatever the state x is, it kind of performs this um, y plus x uh, operation. And this is exactly like the x naught gate, with x, uh, you just kind of keep what x was. So this is the quantum version of XOR, also known as the C naught gate. But in general, you can uh, think of general, um, you know, you can put any single qubit gate you want in the, con in the target parameter. So essentially, you can have cases where um, if the first qubit is zero, it does nothing. If the first qubit is one, it applies whatever single qubit gate you put there. Um, so in general, whatever the, uh, yeah. So in general, the first qubit kind of uh, controls whether or not an operation is done on the second qubit. So here, using these building blocks, we can kind of create this very simple circuit with three qubits. Okay, we have two controls and one target. And the first control, control zero, um, causes a rotation of theta, rotation gate of theta. And the second control, control one, uh, does a, a rotation of two theta. So let's try to work this out. Um, I promise you it's not very hard, okay? Because you just look at the first gate, okay? So we start with whatever x1, x1, x0, whatever it is for the control and uh, the two control qubits, but we let the target qubit be zero. So what we have here is that control zero will uh, not do anything to the target qubit if it is state zero, and it will cause the rotation of theta in if it is state one. And so essentially all you're saying is that you just take x zero, you times theta, right? Because x, if x zero is zero, zero times theta is zero, so it remains in the zero state. Now, so we have already applied the first gate to this qubit. Now we apply the second gate to this qubit. Well, again, it just applies x one times the angle, which in this case is two theta. So you get two x one times theta. And remember that the angles are composed, like we saw just now. And so we just add it to what we had before. And so we have this. In the end, what we have is that the, the final, the target qubit has changed by 2x plus x0 times theta um, of our rotation. And I'm going to call this big X because this is really just the binary representation of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Right? So in, in similarly, I will define uh, those two states together to be big, uh, in the state big X. Uh, in case you're not familiar, I, I think most of you will be, but just in case, if the states are 0 and 0, then the big X is 0. If state is 0, 1, big X is 1. If it's 1, 0, big X is 2. And if it's 1, 1, big X is 3. Very simple. Very simple um, binary representation of numbers. Um, and this allows us to write things a lot neater because then just all the target parts we just put big X, knowing that you know we might we will need lot a uh, lot of that number of qubits to store that number. Um, so what does this something do, right? If you look at this, it's actually quite obvious that. All it does is that it takes whatever big X is and it applies that number of rotations to the target qubit. So it's like your, two, your targets are choosing how many times to do to make the rotation. 
and it just applies it to the target. And we just expand this idea more and more. If we use the same idea, you can work this out if you want. But I mean, I, I think intuitively it makes sense that if it works with two qubits, there's some way to build it up to more qubits. And with, with n control qubits, we can have big N, which is 2 to the power n, possible values that we can put for the target, for the targets. And it can be verified that basically it does the same thing, where um, if you put in big X for all the control qubits, um, and what it'll do is it'll rotate the target qubit by that number of meters. Uh, because this is a bit messy, let me call this uh, control board phase R um, and just compress this like this. And we have a very simple qubit, uh, very simple circuit of controlled rotations. Okay. Another simple circuit <laughs> is having just a lot of beam centers, uh, one after another. Um, this is very simple. Let's say I start with zero for everyone. Um, all it does is that it applies beam centers individually to each of the uh, first few qubits. Okay. Again, uh, just for neatness, let me just group them all into a big B. Um, so what this gate does, what this very simple circuit does, is that it just changes all the first few qubits to plus, except the last one, which we are keep to be the target qubit. And then we can put them together. Okay. We apply the beam set, we, we have this uh, very simple qubit that's just a bunch of beam setters. We have this kind of control rotation thing that, that we can do. And the first part is very simple because the beam center part just makes all of them F plus, except for the last one, which remains to be zero. And we know how this control rotation thing acts on a certain state. Except that we know how it acts on the binary representation of the state we have in terms of the zeros and ones. So we need to re rewrite everything in terms of those zeros and ones. Um, and let me just remind you that this plus state, remember this is really just a, a bunch of beam centers that you act in parallel. It's just a one over root two, uh, zero plus one over root two one. Um, let's do it for the very first qubit on the left. Rewrite it as one over root two zero, one over root two one, leave everything the same. Okay, Look, do it for the second qubit. 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 2, 1, and then the same for the second term. Um, you, you get how it goes. Uh, each time I have to pull out a factor of 1 over root 2. That's why you, you see it goes from 2 to the power of 1 to 2 to the power of 2 to 2 to the power of 3, and all the way to 2 to the power of n for the number of uh, control qubits you have. And if you look at what's going on here, you go all the way from 0, 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2. And actually what you have now is a superposition of every possible number from 0 to 2 to the power of n minus 1. So, so what um, Okay, so going back to what we are trying to do, we wanted to know what this state looks like. And this control R, as a reminder, all it does, uh, I gave you the wrong reminder, uh, all it does is that it controls it causes x amount of rotation based on what the control was, okay, uh, on the target qubit. So it, in the first one, the number is zero, so it doesn't cause any rotation. If the uh, control is x, it will cause x amount of rotation, and so on and so forth until the, the very last number. So this is what we have. We have this basically all the way from zero to two to our n minus one, um, uh, superposition, and for each term, the number of rotation on the target qubit is based on what the control qubit's um, state is. Now, remember that, uh, now we want to find the outcome probabilities. So remember that uh, theta, the state theta is just cosine theta over two plus sine theta over two, of zero and one. So. Again, I'll rewrite, I'll open this up. Um, uh, the, the 
theta zeta. And from the bond rule, we just look at what the term is in front. Right? So the probability of getting uh, x, some x, and 0 is just 1 over n, the mod square of, uh, the square of cosine of that amount of uh, x theta over t. Okay. So if we only care about the probability of the target qubit, the very last qubit being 0, well, it's a probability of x being 0, and the last qubit being 0, x being 1, and the last qubit being 1, and so on. And you just add them up. Uh, and what you have is that you have 1 over n, you add up cosine 0 theta over 2, 1 theta over 2, and so on and so forth. Okay. And if you look at this, it's really just the average probability of measuring 0 given x of theta. Okay. This is where I bring back the geometric picture. So if you are not listening, it's fine. It's actually not. Very, um, it's a bit tedious, but geometrically this is very nice. Like this, um, this circuit. Whatever you get at the end, the probability that you find the very last qubit being zero is just the average over whatever theta you have, and you just like sum it over all the points where each time you rotate it, one theta and two theta and three theta and so forth. Uh, so what we have is a terrible algorithm for factoring times. Okay. So how does this work? We can make additional control gates where the theta can be controlled by two inputs, p times q, where p and q are prime, and l, such that the theta will become 2 pi of pq over l. So you can always uh, build certain uh, control qubits to make that happen. And so let's just take p times q equals to 10 and n equals to 2 and find the probability of measuring each target qubit to be 0. So remember that uh, at the end of this uh, circuit, what you have is that this, you have this 1 over root n, 0, um, the target qubit not rotated, rotated once, rotated twice, and so on. Uh, and for n equals to 4, pq equals to 10, and this kind of uh, weird theta. So if you put l equals to 3 inside, theta will become this, um, will go around many times. Um, and on average, if you average over no rotation, one rotation, two rotation, and three rotation, your average prime will be somewhere there. Uh, for l equals to 4, you end up somewhere here. And L equals to 5, something very interesting happens. Right? So recall that even if you don't recall the bond rule, you recall the geometric picture, the closer you are to the point 0, the more likely you are to find it in the state 0. Okay, that, that when you measure it, you'll find that it's 0. So if you look at the probabilities that you'll find the state to be 0, you find that, okay, you have some, prob some probability, but um, for L equals to 3 and 4, but for L equals to 5, it's exactly 1. So what's happening here is that you have constructive interference, right? Basically, the, number, the loops are such that they all correspond to an uh, integer number of rotations when L is a prime factor of P and Q. So what you can do here is that if you play this game, right, you apply this algorithm and you measure, you measure the system, if you get the outcome 1, you know for sure that your system, uh, that L is not a prime factor of P times Q. Um, so this algorithm basically takes in input P, Q, and L, and it returns 0 and 1. 0 if it might be a factor of P and Q, L, uh, 1 if it is not a factor of P and Q. Uh, again, it's a terrible algorithm because you need, it's basically brute force. Huh? You have to put L for all the way to square root L, um, and you need to repeat a few times to make sure that it's not, um, to be confident that it's not a prime factor. Sorry, to be confident that it is a prime factor. But 
this can be, similar ideas can be used to build more efficient algorithms. This toy algorithm that I showed you, um, if you kind of squint at it, you're like, huh, that looks familiar. That looks like a Fourier transform, right? And with some modification, um, you can actually have a Fourier transform, a quantum version of the Fourier transform, where all the coefficients in front are exactly the Fourier, um, Fourier coefficients, and it requires basically log n squared, big N squared of one and two cubic root. Uh, and in comparison to FFP, does anyone know complexity of FFP? And log n. So this is a exponential in, um, speed up of the Fourier transform. Uh, so, okay, so interference of discrete objects. Um, what is it good for? You have this kind of quantum Fourier transform that is efficient, and you take this kind of interference of time factor related terms, not exactly, not exactly uh, like what I showed you, but similar ideas, and you have something called Shor's algorithm, which um, for time factorization the discrete logarithm, which gives you an exponential speed up, which I mean that's the fear, right? Like that it can break public key cryptography. Um, that's a general idea. Um, there's also things like database search and linear systems, but I think I, okay. So if you're interested, the AWS team actually recently put out a survey called Quantum Algorithms a Survey, um, just like a few months ago, last month maybe even. So just Google Quantum Algorithms a Survey. That's the first thing that'll pop up. Uh, and it's very comprehensive if, uh, to look at. Okay, so a second look at this circuit. Uh, let me go quickly because I'm running out of time at the practice. Uh, so we've just controlled at one target, okay? So if you look at this, this state again, if you have just one control and one target, you realize that it's exactly a state one over root two, zero, zero plus one over root two, one, one. Um, if I extended the, the this, the circuit, the wires like this, uh, rotated it for fun. Um, looks a bit unholy, but let's just say whatever state you have, you can kind of give one qubit to Alice, who is on Alpha Centauri, and Bob, who is in Beta Capricorn. So they are very, they are light years apart, okay? Uh, so the probability that Alice will find zero and Bob will find zero is one, uh, is half. Um, and the, and the probability that they'll find one and one is half, but that it's, um, they, they will not find a case where it's zero and one or one and zero. Okay. So the outcomes are random, but always correlated. And this is what Clive was saying about the Ellis and Bob's qubits are untangled. Uh, so the thing is that this correlation persists even if you put them very far apart. Uh, and this is what Ellis and Bob wants. Uh, box that generates entanglement, but can they really trust that this is not the shoe box scenario? That, that is kind of the, the question that we need to, to ask, right? So for example, if you wanted to scam Alice and Bob by selling them a shoe box and say it's a quantum computer, right? You can try to use the internet, okay? So what you have is that once Bob measures something, well, the detector just has a secret internet connection that sends the answer to Alice and Alice uh, just repeats whatever answer Bob has. But assuming that special relativity is correct, because they're light years apart, nothing can travel faster than light. And so scammers cannot use this method. Now, you can try to use this hidden variable thing, which is you define some random variable right, at the source, and you just send that random variable to Alice's detector and Bob's detector, and you make it so that Alice and, Bob, uh, and Bob's detector just kind of repeats whatever that random variable is. So if you sample half-half for the random variable, every time they will just get, um, okay, so the detectors are now just revealing this hidden variable, but because it's the same hidden variable, of course, you'll always get either the same, um, Alice and Bob will always get the same answer. Now, what if you have a more complicated setup with inputs for Alice and Bob? Let's say Alice and Bob, when they see the qubit coming, 
only when they see the qubit coming. They kind of randomly choose x, they are um, 0 or 1, and they do something to that qubit. Okay? And then they measure it. Now, so x and y are randomly chosen, and only when the qubit actually arrives at their location. Then Alice and Bob can play a game with this setup. You know, it's them versus the machine. So they play this game where they measure A and B for many randomly. So A and B are just the outcome measurements of Alice and Bob. So they measure this for many randomly chosen x and y, um, and they calculate this weird score where E is just how correlated they are. So it's the, the probability that they are the same minus probability that they are different. Uh, and if you, you can actually write it like this, where it's minus one times uh, power of A minus one power of B, because if A and B are both zero, then you get one times one. If A and B are both one, you get minus one times minus one. So it's one if they are correlated. Now, what is the maximum achievable score here? Um, with a fake device, right? We are trying to fool Alice and Bob. So we generate some random variable. This can be an infinite dimensional random variable, but generate some random variable. And then we send the random variable to Alice and Bob. And when Alice and Bob's detector detects this random variable and detects the input of x or y, right? they will return a certain number based on some predetermined code, it, which can be random. Okay? So you can put RNGs into your system, um, but the point is that there is some code that determines what um, the detector should output. Then A and B will be some number for each random variable lambda. Right? For a certain situation of lambda, you'll get a certain number. And if you just look at this, I'm running out of time, so I won't really go through this, but um, you'll find that, basically you'll find that uh, every time for every lambda, it's just some value plus two or minus two. And so this will just be an average of many plus twos and minus twos. And so the best you can do for this score, playing this game with a classical system or playing this game with a fake device is two. Now, if you have a real quantum device, you take this state again, and now Alice um, do, does a rotation of x times pi over 2. So, so she does nothing if uh, x is 0. She rotates by pi over 2 if x is um, 1. And Bob does something similar, but with offset of pi over 4. Um, you can do the math. I, I'll skip the math. Um, and using the calculation, again using a bond rule, which again, you just take the state, write it out, look at what number is in front, square it. That's a probability. You'll calculate that the score now is um, 2 times root 2, which is roughly 2.8, which is strictly larger than 2. So in other words, okay, if a real quantum device can achieve scores larger than any possible, any score possible with a classical device, um, according to Bell's theorem and this version called the CHSH inequality, as long as two assumptions hold, faster than light communication is impossible, and there exists some information that allows someone to predict Alice and Bob's measurement outcomes. And if that someone is an if shopper, well, the score 2 root 2, if you actually achieved it, implies the impossibility that of uh, predicting outcomes. So if that someone was an eavesdropper, that's where you can guarantee security, right? Because it basically tells you that either your system is secure or that relativity is wrong. Um, I mean, one is more likely than the other. So how can entanglement be useful? Um, you take randomness with perfect correlations. Remember that with the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1 that I showed you, you always get both 0 or both 1. The impossibility of predicting outcomes, if you play the game and you get that score, you know for sure that there is no information that exists in the universe that allows you to predict the measurement outcomes. Then you have something called quantum key distribution. Uh, so this, is, this version is called the E91 protocol, and I was re reminded by Felix to mention that um, this was the former director of the Center for Quantum Technologies over here in Singapore. 
he, he invented this protocol. Okay. So this is a protocol that distributes private keys with a security that's guaranteed by physics. And it's a possibility to fix the broken um, cryptography. Okay, I'll end here because I have overrun. So the nice thing about Bell's theorem is that it brings together the two key pillars of quantum theory. Right? This randomness due to uncertainty is intrinsic to nature. It does not and it cannot come from a lack of knowledge. Because again, with Bell's theorem, it tells you that if there was some way to predict the outcome, you would not get to it. Which means that this randomness is not something that comes from our ignorance, but something from nature. And we can go with entanglement, we can go beyond classical relations. This quantum correlations at a distance exist and is something that cannot be explained by classical physics. Unless special relativity is wrong, um, that's a possibility but we will have a lot more problems if that happens. So, okay, I'll just end here. Um, let me just go all the way to the ending slide, the concluding slide, sorry. Ah. Okay, so conclusion, how quantum, for root blocks here. Okay, the geometric picture I showed you is a real mathematical thing. Um, so I, I wasn't just, you know, making it up. Um, the so what of quantum, we have quantum torus transform, exponential speed up, Shor's algorithm, exponential speed up for prime factorization, entanglement, we have Bell's theorem, and how we can use it is in having a way to distribute private keys, and some others. Uh, so, thanks for your attention. Uh, just now you mentioned the post-trip quantum cryptography, like E that I love very call. Can you discuss a bit about the classical uh, post-quantum services methods, like like something like matrix based security and the pros and cons of post post-quantum cryptography methods using classical mechanics like, and using quantum mechanics and what are the strengths and weaknesses? So the answer is that I cannot. Uh, because it's not really my field. I can mention very quickly that it's not known if quantum computing um, belongs in, sorry, if quantum computing can solve any of these problems. It can solve the prime factorization, but nobody knows where the prime factorization is. So that's why, uh, but and that is for encryption, um, you can do it very efficiently in a classical computer. So, uh, QKD, I think um, you'll hear more from physics later on. Um, there are you know, practical issues and stuff like that, so maybe for now, uh, this classical uh, method will be better. So you mentioned that, uh, mentioned that if special relativity was wrong, we would have more problems. What problems would we specifically have in the field of quantum computing if it was proved that special relativity was wrong? And um, basically, you will no longer have causation, so that's really bad. <laughs> Any more questions? No. <laughs> so, if we found a solution, even if we found a solution to P equals N P, would we still be able to use? these quantum technologies for cryptography? I mean, if P equals PMP, which uh, it would imply that a lot of these advantages that quantum has, at least on the computing side, would no longer be advantages. Okay, so it also applies P. But, okay, sorry. But not for QKD, because again, for QKD, um, you are guaranteed that just with those two assumptions, you have security. So I doubt that P equals N has anything to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? All right. This concludes. Jeremy, thank you so much, Jim.